Um, so there we go. Um, without further ado, so that we don't lose time, we first want to thank uh, Nadia for actually asking us to create this, this session. Um, not everybody knows this, but um, for those who are newcomers to implementation working group calls, uh, we actually have a yearly agenda created with our, with our uh, Open Data Charters community. Um, so this session was supposed to be about, uh, the September session was supposed to be about legislative open data. Uh, but Nadia, who is a member of our working group, um, sent an email asking, asking if, if this theme would be, would be right for our agenda. And we actually took upon her pro proposal and worked on creating this, this session. So thanks very much, Nadia. You will hear her, her ideas and her presentation a little bit uh, later today. Um, and without further ado, I'll just do a short, short intro on, on the theme and then just pass on the floor to the floor to Florencia to floor our um, implementation working group co-chair that will um, will moderate this session. So we always say that data coordination is super important, but whenever we're talking about a humanitarian crisis, we're talking about saving lives. Um, we will be hearing different experiences and work done revolving around how can uh, how open data or data can help in humanitarian crisis, the do's and the don'ts that the community, the data community has learned, and um, how data can uh, can show the responses that have been that have been created to to deal with this crisis. From whom uh, is coming the help and the assistance and the funding levels and much more. We're talking about once again saving lives. Uh, in the last report of the state of humanitarian data um, in 2022, the UN estimated that 2,7400 million people would be, in, would be in need of humanitarian assistance and protection at a cost of $41 billion throughout this year. And, uh, and we'll see by the report of next year if that came true or if it even got bigger. So without further ado, I'm Introducing Flor Serale, the Implementation Working Group co-chair, who would be leading this session uh, and introducing our amazing list of speakers today. Flor. Yes, thank you, Nati. And uh, hi, everyone. I'm Flor Serale, Civil Society um, co-chair and Implementation Working Group. I work in UN Habitat in Digital Rights. Um, so it's a pleasure for me today to be moderating this panel. Um, Nati gave a, a really good open remarks, so all I have to say is introducing uh, our amazing panel for today. Um, today we will have three presentations. We will start with Josh Berens, um, Data Responsibility Officer at the Center for Humanitarian Data. Um, secondly, we will have uh, Peter Misek, General Counsel as, at Access Now. And uh, lastly, we will have Nadia Babinska-Birna, who is an independent consultant. Um, she's part of the implementation working group, and she will try to localize um, all um, what the two panelists uh, say at the start to the context of Ukraine. So having said that, just some rules, like each of you will have 10 minutes uh, for your uh, presentation. Then we will open the floor for Q and A's and for a discussion. And just to mention that during the discussion, just for us to have a safe space, we will uh, stop recording. Uh, so like we will only have um, in YouTube uh, only the panel presentations. Um, the idea is for the rest of the implementation working group um, assistance to um, reflect on your own challenges, make questions and let's have a good discussion today. So um, having said that, um, Josh, uh, whenever you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. And let me just share my screen. I hope you can all see this. And how about now? Can you still see the screen? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Great. Excellent. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the great introduction. Again, my name is Jules Spierens. I'm a data responsibility officer with OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data. And I was invited today to speak a little bit to the work that we do here at the center. Um, we're based in The Hague. This is where we have our, our main offices, um, which is in The Hague Humanity Hub. It's a um, kind of a collection building of different uh, offices and organizations all working on 
um, peace, justice, and humanitarian action and using innovation uh, to work towards that. And we've been based here since 2017. It's not the only place where we have our offices. We are also have colleagues in New York, uh, in Dakar, Nairobi, Jakarta, so really spread out uh, across the globe. And our goal is to increase the use and impact of data in humanitarian response. What we, um, the, the three buckets of humanitarian data that we think about uh, in our work are first of all, baseline data. So data about the context of a crisis then situational data, so any information about people affected by a disaster and their needs, and then finally response data, so information about what humanitarian organizations are doing in their response. We work in four different areas of focus. The first is data services, which encompasses all of our data management work, including the humanitarian data exchange, and that's something I'll dive a bit further into later on in the presentation. Then data responsibility, which is the management of data in a safe, ethical, and effective way. So anything related to data protection and privacy. Then data literacy, which is really focused on helping humanitarians make better use of data in their work. And finally, the newest and also quickly growing, and by now the largest work stream, which is on predictive analytics, which is helping us get ahead of crises, prepositioning funding in order to offer a more dignified, uh, more effective and more efficient response. So first of all, data services, and I mentioned the humanitarian data exchange. This is the platform that we offer to the humanitarian community to exchange data related to any humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, by now it's become the go-to place for humanitarian data with over 19,000 data sets. Um, shared by about 300 different organizations and really related to any crisis across the world. And here are some of the, the other figures. In 2021, we had 1.4 million users. Um, again, we had 19,000 uh, data sets shared in total uh, by these 300 organizations. Um, and you can see um, uh, quite, a, quite a high number of, of downloads as well over, over 2021. To give you a sense of the different crises that have received attention um, and have received the sharing of, uh, of data on the platform over the past years. We were launched in, in 2014, uh, the HDX platform. And you can see we really started with the West Africa Ebola crisis. And actually the New York Times picked up on some of the data that we had available on HDX and ran a daily update on the spread of Ebola in West Africa at the time, which really um, gave us uh, a boost in, uh, in, in our usage. Then through the Nepal earthquake uh, to the Rohingya refugee crisis, um, you can see Cyclone Idai and the DRC Ebola crisis. Uh, through more recently the COVID-19 pandemic, and then of course the Ukraine response. So just to give you a sense of some of the key uh, crises that have data uh, on, our, on our platform. The organizations sharing data on HDX will uh, include all of the familiar uh, organizations working in, in the humanitarian response domain. I won't spend too much time on this, but one noteworthy uh, organization sharing data is META in the, in the bottom right. And they share um, what's called population density maps on HDX, and it's some of the most downloaded uh, data on, on our platform. The way we organize data on HDX um, over the past years has um, received uh, this new structure, uh, which is the HDX data grids, where across different categories, we uh, show key data sets uh, that are either available or missing related to a specific response. Uh, and so this is a way of getting an overview of what's on HDX, but importantly, also what we're still looking for. Uh, so what's incomplete. And here are some of the, the criteria for what we include in those, in those grids, but I won't go into, into too much detail here. This is an overview of what that uh, completeness looks like. Um, for the 27 key countries with a humanitarian response plan in place that you see across the horizontal axis. And then the vertical axis shows you the different categories for which uh, we either have or don't have data on those, on those different responses. The state of open humanitarian data uh, 
report which was mentioned in the introduction is something uh, that we've um, produced two years uh, now and uh, indeed we'll we'll see um, about the levels of complete list for for next year um, and this is uh, one of our key uh, key outputs showing the availability of data um, the trends that we see across data be being more or, or less available uh, and so really a, a resource to look out for to give you a sense of some of the more hands-on uh, work that we do uh, in terms of data visualizations, a key product that we've uh, developed together with our Connecting Business Initiative at OCHA is this Ukraine Private Sector Donations Tracker, which has received quite a bit of use um, and is uh, really meant to provide an overview of what private sector entities are donating in terms of the response to Ukraine. Another one which I already mentioned is this um, uh, New York Times visualization based on data on HDX uh, covering the, the West Ebola, uh, the West Africa Ebola outbreak uh, back in 2014. More recently, we've developed this Ukraine um, data explorer, which shows 16 different um, categories of data related to Ukraine, uh, including, uh, for example, um, uh, data from the uh, armed conflict locations database, um, so showing where um, conflict events have taken place, then how uh, refugee streams are flowing um, across the, the border of Ukraine, and various other uh, data types. And really, this um, platform is meant to uh, provide more easy access to these different categories of data on, on HDX. Going into uh, another area of work, uh, this is data responsibility. So again, as I mentioned as the, int in the introduction, the safe, ethical, and effective management of data. Um, the work that we do in this, uh, in this work stream um, comes together across um, the development of guidance and then more hands-on uh, support to our team as they manage data in, in their work. Um, this is an example of the development of guidance. This is the IASC operational guidance on data responsibility in humanitarian action, which was released in February of last year. And this is the first system-wide framework for data responsibility across the humanitarian sector. Um, we co-led the development of this together with the International Organization for Migration and UNHCR, together with a group of about 20 um, organizations under the auspices of the, the IASC. And we're currently revising this document, so um, we will have an update to this in February of 2023. Um, specifically for this group, I wanted to mention the Humanitarian Data and Trust Initiative, which is an initi initiative together with the ICRC and the Swiss government um, to help better understand um, uh, the management of data and related risks by um, donor organizations or donor countries. So this is um, really a, a, a new initiative that's um, focused on understanding the role that donors can play in helping um, further the safe, ethical, and effective management of data across the humanitarian system. Then the final two slides, one is this uh, slide on the results that we've had in terms of growth of unique users on HDX. Um, at least unique users in the top left-hand corner, where you can see the growth since the launch in, in 2014 up till now. Uh, then the organizations on HDX, uh, where here you can see uh, quite a big dip uh, that we had in uh, around the end of uh, 2018, uh, because we removed uh, some of the inactive organizations. Then in the bottom left-hand corner, you see the growth of data sets on HDX. And in the bottom right-hand corner, the cost per monthly unique user, which is something that we look at and try to get down in order to, um, to be as effective and efficient as possible. And then the final slide is to give you a sense of the donors of the center by the phase of operations. In our first business plan from 2017 to 2020, uh, we were funded really predominantly by uh, the Netherlands, so for 71.9%. Um, as you can see in the second phase business plan, um, which runs until mid next year, 
the contribution of the Netherlands has gone down somewhat and you can see we've had a wider variety of donors for this uh, phase of work. So that's to give you a sense of the work of the center. Um, happy to answer any questions. I think we do that towards the end of the call. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Joss. And one of the things that I really liked about your presentation is this data governance framework co-creation process where you have like multiple donors and stakeholders that are part of this uh, co-creating and thinking on how to govern and manage data. And also, of course, the safe, ethical um, and effective management of data, which is super important. Um, so um, I will now uh, give the floor to Peter and then we can continue a discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Mercedes. And it's really nice to meet you all. Um, hopefully you can see and hear me all right. Um, so yeah, I'm Peter Mysek. I'm a general counsel and UN advocacy manager at Access Now. We are a global digital rights organization. We extend and defend uh, the digital rights of individuals and communities at risk around the world. Uh, we accomplished that. Um, our mission uh, since about 2010 uh, through a few different mechanisms. One is our um, convening power, which is expressed through the RightsCon event series, which uh, I hope a lot of you have taken part in. I see some familiar names. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we, uh, in addition to convening all stakeholders like tech companies and others, um, we run a, a digital security helpline. So we provide direct technical support to civil society. Um, so we uh, define that quite broadly, and it does include humanitarian actors, uh, more and more folks um, fleeing uh, conflict situations or insecurity reach out to our helpline, uh, along with a lot of journalists, uh, activists of all stripes, and uh, other organizations that we partner with. So this helpline, um, uh, does produce data, and, and I'll talk about the data that we do make public um, through a few of our initiatives. Um, but the helpline did release a momentous report after uh, the occasion of our 10,000th um, ticket, uh, the processing of uh, 10,000 cases, and we released a lot of aggregate information on the types of cases that come in, uh, the folks that come to us for support, um, the regions they're in and that sort of thing. And just to give you some idea, um, I think the, the plurality of those cases involve uh, social media networks and other um, online platforms and services where people maintain accounts and those accounts uh, can be compromised, um, their access lost or, or uh, taken by an adversary uh, and that sort of thing. So um, it's the helpline. Uh, I suppose I'm just talking a lot. I don't have a nice slide deck, um, which that was a really great presentation, um, but uh, I will share, I think, my screen if that's cool um, and uh, show you some of what we do. Um, obviously on our website, uh, does that come through all right? Uh, cool. Um, all right, so digital security helpline. Um, operates 24 hours a day in up to 10 languages. Um, it's mostly online. You can contact us um, through a variety of means. I think help at access now is the uh, most common way folks get to us. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, we've been um, providing these services uh, to a broad cross section of folks since we started. It was actually our first initiative even before we embarked on you know, policy uh, and advocacy work through public campaigning and legislative work like I engage in. Um, yeah, and um, we are, so we are, a, I suppose, the primary source of data. Uh, I don't know if this is humanitarian data. I think uh, it would take uh, one of you with the expertise to, to tell us that. Um, but again, these are all sorts of attacks that are increasing, uh, that are getting more sophisticated and that are uh, targeting um, Digital uh, civil society quite broadly. Um, generally, I'd say if, you know uh, the right to express yourself and communicate freely and safely and openly and securely isn't the first issue you work on. It should um, probably be pretty close to the second issue because it is, I think, essential to 
um, a lot of the work that we do in terms of not only advocacy, but uh, even delivery, I think, of essential services and humanitarian supplies. Um, so the helpline isn't alone. Um, we are, you know, probably one of the bigger or only global um, focused helpline, but we are growing the community. Um, and that's mainly through CIPA CERT, CERT um, <clears throat> excuse me, meaning uh, usually a computer emergency response team uh, or some variation on that. And so uh, with a number of partners, we are providing um, free of charge help desks and, and uh, support services um, on the technical side mainly, but also dealing with some related issues, maybe physical security um, or um, uh, psychosocial support uh, that uh, some of our partners might refer out to or, or you know, um, refer amongst this network. Uh, also regional support, say if some folks want more preventive support like um, trainings and, you know, um, instruction on the best workflows to use and tools and encryption tools uh, and platforms, then that requires more like maybe in person and, you know, longer term engagement. Um, some folks might specialize in that uh, and do that, you know, at a local level. Um, others like EFF obviously have like big lit litigation capacity. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a strong network, um, and I believe there is some similar organizing among, uh, you know, the more uh, traditional humanitarian folks. Um, uh, but uh, this this network, I think, is a good place to engage um, generally, as it as it does really span the world and has you know a grassroots as well as large groups involved. Um, and we're happy to really um, open the doors to that. Uh, I think it's a, a prosperous list. Um, cool. So I said I would talk about data. I'm, I'm getting there. Um, the helpline does, as I said, have this one report out with the 10,000 cases. Um, but we are working on producing, you know, regular reporting about the threats that we are seeing on the front lines, um, the digital threat, the digital risks uh, to our community and, and to those folks who come to us and to the Civic Cert Network, I would hope. So um, that kind of regular reporting, I think, is something that we could contribute, um, hopefully sooner than later. Um, but, uh, you know, with the big caveat that data security and data protection are absolutely essential and, and will always drive our mission, um, this helpline delivers one-on-one -on -one, uh, support services. And so it um, you know, kind of uh, by design deals with the most sensitive data um, and information about individuals who are being targeted for their work or for who they are. Uh, and uh, keeping that information secure is, is essential. It's been a big project internally as to how we um, handle, uh, process, store, retain uh, data about um, helpline services. And uh, we, can, we can talk more on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but you know, suffice to say, we, we look to the GDPR, but we don't stop there. Um, and uh, we've, we've done a lot of work to try to find uh, the, the best providers, best hosts, um, and the best policies and practices uh, to, to ensure the safety of this data, which is, you know, a kind of a perennial, uh, you never win that one. Uh, you're, always, you're always on the defensive, I think. Um, yeah, so that's the helpline. Um, we do produce some data um, more, again, on the policy and advocacy side, uh, we do public campaigning. And one of the bigger ones that I work on is the Keep It On campaign. Um, this fights uh, internet shutdowns. Um, so we have around over 200 groups involved in this effort. Um, is a global civil society coalition fighting uh, intentional disruptions of internet connectivity. Um, and uh, we, we track and have a global database of uh, the actual uh, events, um, which again, uh, you know, are, are more and more, I think, overlapping with uh, conflict and, and fragile states and situations. Um, and you can see that um, evidence a bit here um, in the regions. Um, where we see these events taking place with um, a lot of them in South Asia, Southern Asia, India, and, and uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Um, but uh, also uh, you'll see uh, Ethiopia with some of the longest running um, in the uh, shutdowns in the world, uh, as well as uh, Myanmar, um, all types of disruptions there, so there's Ethiopia. Um, and uh, yeah, Southeastern Republic of Myanmar. Um, yeah, 73 day shutdown right there. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of data you can look at. Um, we uh, look at the causes, um, political instability, protests, uh, communal violence, um, 
look at who ordered those shutdowns. Um, obviously, this is a fun tool to play with, uh, and I recommend it. Um, types of shutdowns, you know, whether it's the full network or uh, throttling. Um, and then who uh, the a little bit of technical information. Um, so more information is available, um, both uh, qual qualitative, uh, you know, on the impacts of shutdowns through anecdotal reports by folks in different affected communities, um, as well as quantitative data. Um, and that's what we call the stop database. So that's all shutdowns that take place globally since 2016 um, available with you know, even more data points. Um, so you know, happy to share this and speak to it through our Keep It On campaign. Um, we also track elections. Another, we try to predict shutdowns, which is, which is not easy, but elections um, often are correlated with these events. Um, you know, but if I could predict where like gas prices are gonna go up, there's been sh so many shutdowns related to gas hike prices over the last 10 years. Uh, I think that's another kind of a lot of places look, and there has been work done on conflict situations and shutdowns. Um, and uh, Anita Godes from um, St. Gallen and uh, and some other folks at St. Gallen University have done a lot of work on that, um, and uh, I can point you to that. So, yeah, and you know, we we collect a lot of data on various types of uh, incidents. You know, whether it's um, Invasions of digital security, um, account compromises, uh, and uh, or you know full scale shutdowns and censorship. Um, I would say one last area that I wanted to highlight um, that we work is uh, on the spread of spyware. So uh, you may have seen the Pegasus project or may have been involved in it. Who knows? But um, yeah, spyware is uh, invasive remote you know access surveillance technologies. Um, software that is used to invade your devices um, and, and really take over your digital life. Um, and that is increasingly uh, being reported on uh, openly around the world. Um, and it is all sorts of folks being targeted um, for, you know, uh, lawful activities. Uh, and um, we uh, work with partners like Amnesty International and Citizen Lab um, to, to track um, and to provide support, mitigation, um, diagnosis, analysis of devices, you name it. Um, and that is available through the helpline. Um, as far as reporting data on that, I would point you to uh, Amnesty and Citizen Lab for those more comprehensive um, sources. So those are some of the, the main threats we see and some of the data that we produce. Um, yeah, and that, you know, I would definitely open and close by saying that uh, data security is just so essential. Um, we really, we promote norms around transparency and disclosure of, of obviously breach and um, data loss. Uh, and uh, in the humanitarian sector, you know, this problem's not gonna go away if we uh, only talk about it, you know, in hushed tones behind closed doors. Um, at the same time that we push governments, obviously, to um, to strengthen the laws around digital security research, around access to encryption, um, and uh, advanced data protection regulation uh, in ways that uh, uh, teach everyone that you know uh, the best way to keep data safe is to not have data in the first place. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. And um, I was about to. Um close your remarks with with what you said, uh, sometimes collecting data and especially um, where data protection issues and security is so um, risky, sometimes it's not a good idea. And uh, we've been discussing uh, ways of opening up data, but uh, throughout these monthly calls, we have also learned and discussed like how we can um, not collect data or um, the, uh, think on the ways of responsibly uh, collecting, accessing and using data. So thank you so much. And uh, yes, your comment on data protection, um, like we, uh, we throughout these uh, meetings, we have also discussed uh, this uh, balance between opening up the data, but also protecting uh, the data rights of communities and of people. Um, so thank you so much, Peter, for your presentation. And I will now give the floor to Nadia. Um, Yes, Nadia, are you, yes, thank yes, you. Here. Uh, I hope that you hear me well. Um, I will speak here from Kyiv, from Ukraine, one of the hottest, I think, uh, regions now in the world regarding uh, war, the war that is happening now, full-scale war in Ukraine. And I want to speak a little bit about different aspects of the open data. It's about how 
access to public information, how freedom of information, access to public information in open data format can be implemented or can be threatened, uh, not only by the war, but also by uh, the national government and local government as well. And I will share my screen if possible. Yes, you can you can see my yes. I am so I will speak about war and open data in Ukraine. Uh, it will be like Ukrainian uh, use case. Uh, I think it's the first time in the world when uh, open data in when such uh, like a such country with uh, highly developed open data infrastructure and ecosystem face these challenges regarding access to public information uh, in open data form and access to public information in general. Uh, just to provide you some overview about Ukrainian open data level is that open data started to develop by, uh, started developing very fast after the evolution of dignity. It's something uh, for it's something uh, that people died during the revolution of dignity for, uh, and the reform of access to public information and digitalization of a lot of registers and openness of these registers were one of the demands that revolution of dignity activists put and uh, forced the Ukrainian government to implement. Uh, so we have open data legislation, one of the best, uh, and it's even better than EU legislation, open data directive 2019. We uh, we already compared the, our legislation and EU legislation, and we find it uh, really better uh, for open data users and for open data, for data holders. We have open data portal with more than 60,000 data sets. We have also business register as open data since 2017. And also we have the beneficial ownership information data. The beneficial ownership data is well accessible. We have plenty of open data hackathons, challenges, and plenty of startups. And uh, we also try to count how many and how many uh, millions or billions uh, USD dollars can um, open data uh, bring to the Ukrainian economy and it's around one GDP until 2025. And Ukraine was mentioned as one of the fastest trackers among other uh, EU plus countries as according to the open data maturity report conducted by the EU um, European uh, data portal, and uh, according to the latest global data barometers, Ukraine was one of 20 best uh, open data developed, developed countries. Uh, and we have we used to have before the history of war uh, more than seven million users uh, users of the startups portals uh, based on open data mind. So we have really good developed open data infrastructure and ecosystem before the full scale war uh, in February 2022 came to our home. So what the war uh, brought to us, I mean open data community and open data users and uh, open data activists, it, uh, human rights restrictions, of course, we are restricted by uh, in many, many, many uh, ways. So uh, a lot of restrictions regarding, uh, regarding mobility, a lot of restrictions regarding freedom of information, and we have also restricted access to data. A lot of open data, uh, a lot of portals, registers, uh, cadastres were closed. Uh, it was uh, very it was very fast decision of course nobody everybody talked about the beginning of war but you know um it was unexpectedly for many people as well so it, everything was closed no data were available for many months uh, no legislation how open data should function during the war time also no instructions for data holders for data users and as I mentioned, we had a lot of startups that were built on open data. I know instructions from the government for data users, uh, and it was real, like not only regarding the uh, awful situation in, in the war field and uh, uh, with the humanitarian crisis and so on, so on but, uh, but uh, we didn't have 
uh, like any understanding how the situation to access to public information with open data will be developed uh, after. So we can have a look at the uh, registers and open data portal. So everything was like access was restricted to data and it, uh, there were very important data well, was very important data such as data about the core decision data about the land product data about the uh, the business register and so on and so forth and this data uh, helped to combat com and mitigate corruption risks for example because war didn't uh, change the and doesn't change uh, corruption risks and it doesn't mitigate it so what happened next after the war, the full scale war started in summer, some portals started to work again. So for example, we had uh, open data portal uh, was so opened and relaunched, uh, but a lot of uh, important and uh, social, social important uh, and anti-corruption economically important data sets are not published. And uh, our government developed new legislation on open data regulation and it uh, embedded these restrictions and a lot of discretion, dis uh, discretion for local and national government regarding open data. So, for example, some data sets they are forbidden to be accessible to be accessible for public till the end of the war, and we don't know where this war is going to end, as you know. And a lot of discretion for local and national governments for them to decide what to publish or not. So, of course, we understand that a lot of data sets they can be used by our enemy to, you know, to, to, to kill people, to kidnap people, and to torture people. We understand that, but please explain, for example, what, uh, what harm and what uh, problems can cause data about, for example, plants and this access to this register is also uh, um, restricted. So we, as, as a community, we don't have any explanations why some data, okay, we, we understand why some data regarding military objects and regarding occupied uh, temporary yeah, occupied territory, the territories are uh, restricted, but regarding many, many other, we have regions which are not um, fully engaged into this war, uh, war affairs, I don't know how to call it. Uh, and uh, the corruption and everything hasn't uh, hasn't disappeared after the beginning of the war, the full scale war. So a lot of questions still unanswered, and that is why we collected uh, signatures under the op uh, appeal from the open data community to the government to please start to open data because we need this data to rebuild to re to to renovate our Ukraine after the. Uh, not after, but even during the war, because some territories, they are already, um, they are occupied and we need to reconstruct these regions. We, we need to show that this is, uh, so everything will be transferred. Everybody sees everything. Uh, and uh, for, for, for business, for uh, civil, civil society, we need data to understand what is happening in Ukraine, what kind of decisions are made. Uh, to analyze it and to predict something, at least on the territories which are not occupied. Uh, and uh, what kind of challenges can we see if we have open data, like a lot of data that we used to have? Is that, uh, well, it's a question mark, I don't know, we have to think about that, whether open data makes country which is in war or in a conflict uh, vulnerable during the war. What kind of data enemy can use? For example, if we have uh, um, asset declarations of our politicians, whether this data can be used during the war against these politicians, or um, is this threat bigger than the threat that not having this data, a lot of bad people can come into power in Ukraine and make uh, Ukraine like impossible to, re to be rebuilt. So this is, but this is all about the balance, yes. Um, uh, another challenge is whether we have human resources to publish data, to maintain portals and registers. As you know, humanitarian crisis in Ukraine caused to many, many millions of people to, uh, to, to move to other countries to flee. And that is why a lot of, for example, uh, um, 
a lot of uh, institutions that administrated registers or portals, I mean, governmental, they just don't have human resources to do that as they used to do uh, these things. So it's also a question mark who should, who should maintain this all IT infrastructure that um, made uh, data like generate generated data and um, uh, as a result we could have access to some uh, data from these registers and portal uh, uh, another question is what to publish and provide and on what uh, uh, for your request we have to, uh, we as government for example we have to provide answers and we as the society can um, request uh, so it's also the question that uh, the government can just say we don't publish it, we are not going to publish it because it's the one. No, please explain us why, for example, if the list of patents uh, on plants or the list of plants is forbidden to be published, uh, but use, for example, uh, we have business register, uh, business register data is not published as open data, but it is sell, it is sold uh, to Russian affiliated companies uh, as like access to this register is open uh, like for money uh, via API. So it's like, it's nonsense. Uh, and another issue is that all data, you know, uh, if something is published uh, somewhere, it's uh, on, on the internet, it, will, it, it is accessible. So it's already available. And of course, a lot of startups, a lot of um, portals and registers, not governmentally provide access to this data that, you, you, uh, that is forbidden to be published. So this also, Let's, let's think about whether these restrictions are working and efficient and effective. Uh, but what kind of benefits can uh, open data bring to countries, for example, like Ukraine, which suffers from this full war? Is that uh, we, can, we can track and uh, we can uh, find Russian and affiliated businesses using open data. I mean, we it's like a, a, a civil society you know, together with the government and law enforcement and uh, in the intelligence. Uh, open data can help us to prevent corruption, not only now, you know, like over the like, uh, daily basis, but also to prevent corruption during the uh, renovation and rebuild of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, like the, the life, ordinary life, still exists in Ukraine, okay? We have the public money, we have the, the procurement, we have everything. So uh, the need of open data is essential to monitor, to prevent corruption. And also open data can help to, uh, to develop businesses. And the business and business development means more taxes. So this one GDP, and as you know, like war uh, costs a lot. Uh, this one uh, percent of GDP is important as well, and we should count very carefully uh, what kind of losses do we have if we publish data, and what what, what can we gain uh, publishing by uh, publishing data. And of course, there are a lot of data which is needed during the war. For example, uh, data about sanctions, who is sanctioned, why, uh, and uh, how these data are published as well. I mean, whether we can identify people and businesses sanctioned uh, with different registers. And even if we have sanction list published, but business register closed, how we can, uh, I mean, me, we as uh, you know, civil society, how we can um, compare these two data sets, we can't. Uh, regarding uh, uh, also data for, uh, uh, regarding Russian killed uh, killed Russian Russians during the war and wounded at other data regarding Russians uh, about war crimes you know a lot of war crimes committed by Russians on the Ukrainian territory and a lot will be uh, also um, uh, discovered during the, the occupation of Kherson and other regions. Uh, a lot of damage to ecology caused, and now we, we almost have no ecology data. Uh, but these data are important for uh, experts, for um, think tanks, for civil society, for experts to think how we have, we have to rebuild.
and everything. Uh, data about received aid and disseminated uh, humanitarian aid is also very important. About refugees and IDPs, thank you very much, Jos, for mentioned about data you collect, your resources collected, but we do want that these data are officially published by our government, by Ministry of Social Defense, uh, Ministry of Education, and so on and so forth. And a lot of demand is about the data, about the damage caused by the war. Uh, and uh, now we are, like in Ukraine, government is creating um, the system to, um, to rebuild Ukraine and to collect the data about the damage. And we are, we are forcing our government to make this data public because to make making this data public um, create more creates more uh, trust to the uh, uh, rebuild to the process of rebuilding of Ukraine. So a lot of data is important, economic situation and so on. So far, we have the whole, the full list of data which is needed, and we don't have access to this data. So. Um, uh, I, I don't have answers to many questions now, and we still in our community, the Ministry of Digital Transformation, we even inside our community, we are still discussing uh, what kind of data should be published, how this data should be published, whether we have to let government to have this unrestricted dis discretion of power, uh, whether we have to wait till the end of the war. Uh, and I, uh, I'm not sure that even our community, international community, has such answers because uh, it's something that, uh, like, lives of people on stake, you know, and uh, it's very hard to advocate something, it's very hard to explain something because a counter argument you hear is. Do you want people to be killed? Do you want more territories to be occupied? So it's just to maybe just to uh, raise questions, not to answer them. Maybe our uh, participants of our meeting also can uh, provide some their view on the situation, how we should implement open data policy, whether we should have open data policy during the war. Uh, and of course, I have to mention, please stop war in Ukraine, support Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nadia, for this uh, last presentation. Uh, and uh, I want to thank every everybody here. Uh, we still have seven minutes for questions and, and comments. And I see, Paul, you already have one question. Uh, Paul, do you want to unmute yourself and do the question out live? Or would you rather me read it? It's a question for Joss. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your great presentations. Um, and Joss, I was just wondering whether you have any impact stories from uh, from your data being reused, whether, uh, so apart from 